Uh, this is a great season. Good to see all of your faces. Good to see those that are joining with us um, from all the places, whether it's here live today or whether you're picking us up uh, later in the week or on demand. We're glad that you're joining us. It is a busy season. It is such a busy season that we thought as a, a worship staff that we really wanted to focus on a topic called simple, simply something, simply Christmas. And so every week we're, we're kind of getting into this mode of, of looking into the simplicity of life and some of the things that we're going to wrestle with. And today um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the birth of Jesus and uh, simply born. But I was thinking as I was um, putting this message together, I was thinking about this season as a kid. Now Christmas in the eyes of children is remarkable, right? How many still have like young children or grandchildren or even great grands? Great. And I was thinking about way back when in the ancient world when I was in, you know, elementary school. And uh, I had a part in the school Christmas pageant. Back then you could do Christmas pageants. We did a Christmas pageant. Now, none of my brothers, I have three older brothers, none of them were ever involved. They didn't have an acting gig like I did, you know. But I was involved in this uh, little Christmas pageant. I had a bit part. I was one of the three wise men. But I was really nervous. And I was rehearsing my lines and I was practicing them daily. And I was making sure that I could like pull this off without a hitch because I wanted to make mom and dad proud. So there, there we were. There was my friend Randy, my friend Barry, Barry, and, uh, and also me. And we're the three wise men. And, and so we were all kind of thinking about this little gig that we had. And it was the night of the performance. So, you know, uh, Randy goes out there and he walks up to the place where the Christ child is. And he says his line, he says, gold. And then Barry decides he's going to go, so he goes out there and he says, myrrh. And I was so nervous. I walked out there shaking my package and I said, Frank sent this. <laughs> okay. Well, we're in week two, Simply Christmas. We're talking about Simply Born. And I want to take you back to Luke chapter two. Two gospels, Matthew and Luke. They give us kind of the inside story about the birth process, uh, the prior to the birth, the escape into Egypt, uh, the shepherds, all of that. Those are going to be found in Matthew and Luke. So I want to take you to Luke's gospel. Luke gives us more of a historical point of view about the actual birth of Jesus. So let me take you to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. There's a lot of debate on why the census, but scholars believe that the census was being taken because this new king of kings was to be born. And Caesar wanted to know, who, who is this going to be? Others say that he was trying to understand so that he could know, you know how many slaves that he had to do his biddings in Rome. So either way, whichever you look at it. But what, what Luke says is it, it was the first census taken since Quirinius was governor of Syria. This is great because it tells us it's a factual event historically. And secondly, it kind of puts it in a time frame so we can look up historically when Quirinius was governor and we would know that that, that was the time that God had chosen to reveal God's self to the people. He said, all return to their ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, if you go into Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter one, and those portions there, you'll see the lineage of all of that. Because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was now expecting a child. You know, um, Matthew tells us a little bit more about that dicey situation about, you know, Mary being pregnant and the betrothal and all that. Go to that gospel, read about it. I think you'll be duly touched when you read that story. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this story, but what we're learning is some 1,400 miles away in Rome, Caesar Augustus says, you need to go to your hometown. So Mary and Joseph embark on this particular journey because that's where Joseph's lineage to King David is. Bethlehem was the place. So they, they had been betrothed. Some say they had already been married. Others say it's just a betrothal. But either way, we understand that they have to return to that. And because Mary is in a betrothal agreement, or whether she's married to him, that she is tied to him, and therefore they are required by law to visit there. 
There's something in this story we need to know. Mary is nine months pregnant. Nine months. So, ladies, if you've ever been pregnant and you're at that ninth month, you know how difficult things are, how, how exhausting things can be and all. And here's the thing, that, that, that the Romans, even though they issued the edict to go into Bethlehem, Rome couldn't care less that Mary was pregnant. They couldn't care less that any woman was pregnant this time. In fact, if they lost their child in transit, it didn't matter. All that was important, according to Rome, was to be there so that you could be counted as part of the census. But Mary has been told, she's been promised, an angel has appeared and says that you will have the Holy Spirit come upon you and that you will be with child. And this is not just any child. This is Christ the Lord. And she begins to understand a little bit of the story as it unfolds. In the first century, um, things were different than they are today. Now, childbirth is not routine today. Lots of things can still happen in childbirth day. Despite all the technological advancements that we have, there can still be complications. So I don't want to say that, that today is that different, but, but in the ancient world, it was even worse. In fact, a lot of women died during their pregnancies. A lot of women died during childbirth. In fact, babies died during childbirth. And it was just a horrific instance. And Mary knew that all this was going on. And what was really important back then was that you had the right midwife, that you had the right midwife selected to help you. Just like today, that we would maybe pick an obstetrician or, or we would pick a midwife who could help out with all the complexities and things that could go wrong, who could be there to negotiate and navigate everything to bring the child safely into the world. Mary had thought about that. She had thought about, you know, what her birthing room would look like. She had thought about, like in those days, it was so important to have your family around because you wanted to be surrounded by people who loved you. And if your mother was still alive, you wanted your mother there at your bedside and you wanted the midwife there and, and you wanted people that cared about you just in case, but that they could help you through this process. And this is how Mary would have pictured the first Christmas. Mary would have, she would have pictured it this way, but Luke tells us that it's not at all what happened. In fact, Luke says that, that the order came through to make the trip. Mary hadn't had time to Google a midwife in Bethlehem yet. And Joseph, he was like, well, he was just kind of, I got to get you there. I got to get you there. And off they went. And let me put this in perspective. So from, from Nazareth to Bethlehem would have been a 90 mile journey. Now think about it for a second. From here to, here to Lakeland, okay? And maybe five more miles. So, so here's Mary. She's nine months pregnant. It's a four-day journey, and she's got to get from a place from like here where we are to Lakeland plus five miles. And here's the interesting part. Despite what we all think and what we all have you know, said through the years, none of the gospel writers say that she was on a donkey. So we have to assume she's been walking. She's been walking this four-day journey 90 miles to get where she needs to be. Now imagine if you've been walking four days, if you've been trying to get, think about birth and everything that you had hoped for, dreamed about, thought about, about having your firstborn. Now the question becomes, is Mary idyllic? Is she, is she excited? Is she dreaming? Is she just over herself, you know, bubbly with joy because of this pregnancy and bringing her firstborn in? And the answer is probably not because she's thinking of the reality of all of this. She's thinking about the challenges and the troubles. Now, I wanna kinda of, um, stretch the story a little bit. So what I'm gonna share with you a little bit of insight is not scriptural, but I'm gonna insert us in the story. And this is really important that when we read the scriptures, we need to insert ourselves into the story. So I'm gonna take the liberty to kind of help us to look at it uh, through a lens that might be interesting for us to look at. So, so imagine it this way, it's very dark, it's at night, they've been walking tens, if not almost 100 miles, and all of a sudden, after four days, you know, Mary and Joseph are on this journey. I can imagine Joseph, you know, they didn't have Duke power back then, Duke energy, so there's like no street lights, there's no like neon signs, there's no storefronts that are lit up so they can see where they're going. So Joseph's probably staggering along, fumbling and bumbling. He's probably tripping over stones and rocks, catching his sandal and not sure, you know, losing his balance. But the one thing that I just have to trust is that he's concerned about Mary. He's concerned about her health. He's concerned about her situation. And in those times, the question would have been, are you quiet? Now, 
What that means is, is not, are you not talking and shh? What it means is, are you quiet? Are you not in pain? Are you not ready to give birth? Are you quiet? Are, are, you, are you okay like? And I can imagine it for a while, Mary saying, it's good, let's just keep going. <laughs> we gotta get there, we gotta get there. Because in their mind, they have to be thinking about, well, there's an inn there, and, and, and that inn has to have some room. And no, we didn't you know, go on Travelocity and make a reservation, but we're gonna just trust that we can get there. And they're moving in that direction. But then the, the tides turn, and, and in that evening, Joseph turns and he says, are you quiet? And it's at that moment, I just have to guess it, that Mary says, no, I'm not. We've gotta get there now. Let's just make sure that we get there now and quickly and get to the city of David. Now, what they had not thought about was how crowded it was going to be. Now, I was kind of losing my nerve last night in the parking lines trying to get into a parking garage at an event at the Amelie Center. And I can't imagine what it would be like to, to have a nine-month pregnant wife, dark, tired, four days journey and trying to find a place. So, so they go to the inn and the inn pictured it's kind of on a hill is where the inn is located. And, and um, you can overlook that into the mountainside. You could probably hear shepherds whistling for their sheep at night, calling their sheep. And on the flip side to that is a, is a place where animals were stored. And I can imagine Joseph going into this inn and the moment he opens the door, he knows he's in trouble because he, he's got to know that if there's any place in the world that has somewhere for them to stay, it's the end. And he goes in there and it's got to be wall to wall people. I'm probably estimating maybe a million people had ascended, uh, descended onto the town of David uh, in Bethlehem so that they could do this census. And so the innkeeper likely even sold his room and kicked his own family out into the hallway. So there's people sleeping in the hallway, there's people standing up, there's people you know, hanging on staircases, their rooms are filled, and Joseph's asking, can you do something? Now, here's where I think grace and compassion come in. And I, and I think probably uh, the innkeeper's wife likely whispers to him, we gotta do something. And she says, why not send them down below? So the innkeeper likely looks at Mary and Joseph and says, if your wife needs some privacy, you can go down where we keep the animals. Now, let's not think about this as like some big barn here that we have in the country, in our country, like in the United States, these big commercial barns. This is probably like a hovel, probably a lean-to. Uh, all the animals are tied up. They're feeding down there. And so all of a sudden, Mary says to Joseph, the time has come. You need to take me there. Now, back in the, in the 80s when my children, when our children were born, I remember what it was like to be in a birthing room. You know, there was like a bed. There was um, a very bright light, and there were some instruments that were that were on one of the little shelves there by the bed that were brought in by like a, a little cart that wheeled in. And I, and I know what it was like then, but there, there's no way in the world that that's what Mary had. Mary had nothing. And I started thinking a little bit about, you know, today, birthing is big business. In fact, hospitals invest millions of dollars in big birthing centers. And if you've given birth to a child lately, if you've visited a family member who's given birth to a child lately, the where they give birth and the birthing suites today are totally different than what I remember when, when our children uh, went and were born. So let me read this little article to you. It's an advertisement from a Midwest hospital that's trying to solicit uh, couples to come in and have babies. Each room is like a resort spa. Relax in the whirlpool tub. Stretch out in the queen side bed for you and your loved one to share if you wish. And I'm thinking like, that time's long gone by now. <laughs> okay. Admire your newborn sleeping nearby in their heavenly crib. Enjoy the attention of nurses who pamper to the needs of the entire family. Pop in your favorite CD. Stream your favorite show on Roku while, while indulging in freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. I, I read that and I looked at Patty. I said, I want to have a baby because, you know, and she's like, Bob, it's not going to happen. So, so, but let's look at what Mary was subjected to. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for him. You know that song, Silent Night? I mean, it's, it's, it's angelic. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. There's no way birth night was silent. It's not. I mean, look, I've never given birth to a baby, but I've stood beside a loved one who did birth two babies, and it was not quiet. It was noisy. 
I was being called names and thrown out words that I can't say in church. And, and things that I was being called about because I did that to her. And her head started spinning at one point, you know, and well, that's a different movie, I think. But anyway, so, so I know what it's like, and, and it's painful, and, and it's not quiet. And, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, I, and my wife had an epidural. <laughs> she was feeling good. <laughs> Mary had none of that. But yet Jesus was simply born. And to think about all that came with that, all that came with that. It was messy. It was unsettling. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the woman to give birth to the King of kings and Lord of lords. The birth happens simply in that moment. You see, to think about that, um, it also makes us think about, okay, all of the um, discomfort that Mary went through, all the disillusionment. You know, when you're going to have a baby, you're thinking about, we're going to do this, and it's going to look like this, and all these people will be here, and all these other things. But for Mary, none of that happened. And you sit there and you think about the challenges, the pain that she had to go through, the disappointments. And you know what? It puts an interesting perspective on Christmas. The mother of God, the mother of Jesus, had disappointments. The mother of Jesus experienced pain. She experienced loneliness because none of her family was there, just Joseph. And it kind of lends credibility to the fact that so do we. We feel the same things. In fact, if we look at the story and peel it back even more, Mary finds herself alone at this birth. And 34 years later, her son will find himself alone at his trial. Lots of things coming into being. But then there's this manger, a manger. So let's take a look at, you know, so here, here's probably what it looked like. You know, it's not like this wooden thing with a, you know, a little headpiece over it and hay coming out. Uh, it was probably a stone feeding trough. In fact, I'm almost convinced it was. That's what Jesus was placed in. Animals had drank water from there. They had slobbered in it. They probably had urinated in it and all the nasty things that animals do. They ate out of it. And there had to have been a point where Mary looked at that and said, I'm to place my newborn baby in this? She did it anyway. In fact, if we, if we really look at this further, there's no guarantee that Mary gave birth to Jesus in a building with a roof over it. And, and like, I mean, we think it was kind of, we call it a stable, but more like a lean-to, but it's more of a, um, an outdoor kind of facade leaning against where animals gathered. So it's possible that, that that food trough, that manger, was maybe in the middle of the town square. And Mary gave birth there. We don't know. We just know that it was a difficult, difficult time. I can see Joseph apologizing, feeling like he failed her. I didn't get you what you wanted. I didn't get you what you deserved. You, we should have had a room. We should have had a, a midwife. In fact, it was, it was required by law, so they could have been in trouble. And, and Joseph must have felt ashamed that he couldn't give his wife all that she deserved. And, and I can just imagine Mary looking at him saying, but you're a faithful husband. You're a faithful, soon to be a faithful father. And it's okay, because we're gonna get through this together. I can imagine that Mary turned around at the haltered animal and all the things that were happening and recognized that that's where the birth would occur. Think about this for a second with me. I mean, when, when kings are born, I mean, isn't it different? When kings are born, um, announcements are made, you know, photographs go everywhere, paparazzi comes out, uh, you know, like a royal family kind of thing. And, and we, we see this big royal thing. Everybody's waving and excited and happy. And, but that didn't happen with Jesus. And he was the king. And so we, we find that, that this is really humbled and, dumb, and dumbed down in a, in a great way. Jesus was born is a way to reflect the character of God, the simplicity, the humility, the genuineness, 
in all the traits of God that we yearn toward. The the birth of Jesus is a lesson in God's faithfulness, but it also reveals God's heart and character. God identifies with the human race, and the birth into the world is proof of that, that the creator decides to come face-to-face with the created. That God loves you, God loves me so much that he leaves his celestial throne, the creator of the universe, and makes his way intimately in a space with you and me. In the ancient world, if anybody asked the question, well, well, who's the most powerful king that there is? And, and the answer would have been, well, it's gotta be Caesar. And at that time, it was. And yet, God came in the flesh not to be a king to outpower Caesar by rule and warriorship and wars and the things that come with that. But he came as a king of humility, a king whose heart was of servanthood to demonstrate the direction that you and I are to go. The birth of Jesus also shows that greatness is not a function of the size of one's bank account. Greatness is not the size of one's profession. Greatness is not the size of one's um, educational background. That's not how greatness is defined in this birth term. But greatness is defined by approachability. Jesus calls out to the least, the lost, the lonely. And he says, come to me, and I'm gonna give you the rest that you need. Blessed are you in all of these circumstances. But simply born communicates, Jesus specifically describes himself as meek and humble. He made the entire universe, and yet he comes back plainly. Simply. Here's the message in a nutshell. God came this way so that God could be near you. God came this way so that you could see who God is in the flesh. So that way, all that ethereal stuff, all of that stuff that we just think about and we're not really sure, it could be seen. And God needed that to happen for us. Jesus was simply born. Simple enough to say, approach me. Here's my love for you. 